So this week, uh, I feel like I'm going to take you down the rabbit hole uh, a little bit. Uh, we started back in Hebrews, and we're going to be spending the majority of our time down that rabbit hole, wandering around, seeing what's going on. So we're going to take a look around down there. Then right at the very end, we're going to pop our head uh, up for air at the very end and try and ask some questions about what is it that uh, we've pieced together this week. So it was last week that we noticed that the author of Hebrews used Psalm 95 text quite often for uh, his argument in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, this argument about a believer's rest that we've been taking an extensive look at. And so we noticed Psalm 95 was used pretty extensively in that discussion. It seems to be one of the key passages. So we found that when we went back into Psalm 95, it wasn't uh, this general behavior of this wilderness generation that was being pointed out in Psalm 95, but it was a specific place. We saw the place names Meribah and Massa. There is something that happened at that place that seems to be instructively different than their collective behavior throughout the 40-year period. Let me say that again, because I think that uh, there's a crux here that we're going to be hanging on to. There seems to be something instructively different about Meribah and Massa, what happened there, than their general behavior, which seems to be almost exactly the same <laughs> over the 40-year period of time. There's some reason that Psalm 95 is pointing out Meribah and Massa. And so that's where we're going down the rabbit hole to see, and uh, that's where your lesson took you. Um, we're going to begin, though, in Psalm 95, verses 8 and 9, and it says... Uh, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness. And I just wanted to point out hardening your hearts. It seems like something that uh, we have, these people had a chance to take part in, or that we as readers have a chance to take part in. We could harden our hearts. So don't do that. Well, how do we not do that? Well, <laughs> as in the day, as the way they did it at Massa in the wilderness, at that place called Meribah where your fathers tested me. So, and it says not only where your fathers tested me, but in verse 9 it says, they tried me though they had seen my work. And I think that's going to be a key, a key statement right there in verse 9. When your fathers tested me at that place, that we're going to go check it out, they tested me there, they tried me, which is, that word tried is just a different Hebrew word for tested, okay? Uh, though they had seen my work. There's something about having seen God's work that turned it into that episode, according to Psalm 95. I think, I think that's important. Um, so what work does that mean? Well, what's happened thus far? They've been in slavery for over 400 years, so um, they had a long period of time where God wasn't seemingly interactive with them, at least not as interactive as he has been of late in the story. Um, so it could be uh, the plagues in Egypt. That, that was pretty impressive interaction with God. They had seen his work there. Could be the plagues. It could be the crossing of the Red Sea where they saw his work. Or it could be a combination of those two and episodes or events that happened after the crossing of the Red Sea. So we're going to uh, first go back uh, where I didn't take you in the lesson to Exodus 14. So if you got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to be there. Uh, Exodus 14 has the story of the Red Sea crossing, the Sea of Reeds. And in Exodus 14, I'm going to be starting in verse 10 and reading down kind of through verse 14. It says, Pharaoh is drawing near. We, we all know the story, right? We all know what's happening. They're fleeing. Pharaoh is in pursuit. They don't know what to do. They seem to be put in a position that they can't solve themselves, right? Isn't that just like God? <laughs> and so Pharaoh is drawing near. The people cry out to the Lord. And then they complain to Moses. Let, let's see, right at the end of verse 10 here. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. That's interesting. And then what's the very next thing they do? Which I think crying out to the Lord is a good thing, right? We see Moses doing it a lot. So I think it's a good thing. But then the very next thing they do is, then they said to Moses, grumble, grumble, complain, complain, right? So uh, I think they started out okay, and then they went to their grumbling and complaining. Uh, what do we see when we get further into the stories? 
we see a whole lot of grumbling and complaining. Do we see the people crying out to God? We, we see Moses doing it on their behalf, but uh, we kind of lose that. So that may be a portion of uh, what we could take away from this and maybe apply to ourselves. Uh, they went in straight into c- complaining to Moses. But look at Moses' response down in verse uh, 13 of chapter 14 of Exodus. He said, I'm going to give it to you in stages. Don't fear. It's interesting. Um, now, I'm, gonna, I'm talking about this story, but as I even talk about the story, I'm expecting you to take what I'm saying because ultimately we're trying to apply this to our lives, okay? Where God might uh, bring you into a place where you are in a position that uh, up against a circumstance that you can't solve on your own, right? Moses' instructions would be likely the same to you. Don't fear. Interesting. And then he says, stand by. In my version, it says stand by. Probably a better translation is take your stand. In other words, get in a place where you can see what's about to happen. Okay? Because you don't want to miss this. Because it's when you see this that something will be confirmed or communicated to you that you need to remember. Right? So, take a stand and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish with you today. And then notice what he says. Verse 14. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Do you see that? The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. What does this keeping silent mean? Um, I have to be honest, I need to do a little bit more work on this, but I've done a little bit. And I know that it's, it's used about 47 times in the Old Testament, this Hebrew word for Uh, keep silent. It's got a lot of different senses to it. What's one sense? Well, the most obvious, uh, shut up, (laughs) right? (laughs) Stop talking. And in this case, more accurately, stop complaining, right? I'm not talking to you. I'm just saying what the story, (laughs) okay? Okay, get that straight. I don't want anybody to feel like I'm stepping on their toes tonight. Um, So yeah, keep silent. Uh, it certainly talks about no speaking, but it also has a sense in other uh, contexts, it has a sense, that, and it could be here, uh, listen in silence. Sometimes it's translated as listen in silence, which is what you're able to do when you stop talking, <laughs> when you're not complaining, and you find yourself in silence with the Lord, you are then in a position where you are able to listen. For what? For whatever it is he's trying to communicate to you. How does he communicate? Well, any number of different ways, right? So, while you keep silent. What's the third way? It also carries, this Hebrew word also carries the idea of someone who is deaf. And that throws even a little more tweak to it. So, it's somebody that's not able to hear, in other words. The Lord will fight for you even while you're grumbling and complaining and you're not listening and you're not even able to hear what he has to say. He will still be fighting for you. Ooh, how about an amen to that, right? Yeah. So that's a loaded verse, verse 14. There's a whole sermon there, (laughs) okay? It carries all these ideas. It's almost as if Moses is saying, Lord's going to be fighting for you, you who are deaf, you, while you listen in silence, he'll be fighting for you. Just listen. Stop talking. (laughs) Take a a silent stand, and from that perspective, see the salvation that the Lord will accomplish on your behalf. Wow. Exodus 14, 15. Um... The Lord says, uh, this is very interesting, after what Moses says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell them to go forward. (laughs) Which is very interesting as well, right? Why are you, (laughs) let's, in other words, what's God saying? Let's get a move on, right? It's it's not that you have to be non-active while you're not talking and listening, right? And I think sometimes we get in our perspective, we get this idea of I've got to take time away, which I'm not against taking time away, 
But here, in this circumstance, God says, let's get a move on. Why are you crying out to me? I've given you the first set of instructions already. Let's go. Okay? And I'll tell you more. It's kind of like Abraham when he was uh, told to go uh, to a land, which I will show you. He doesn't tell him ahead of time. He's saying, I'm, I'll just tell you where to go next, and then go there, and then I'll tell you the next step. So I think it's here. Why are you crying out to me? Let's get a move on. This ties back into our psalm. All of this perspective that we just came out of it ties back into our Psalm 95, verse 7. I don't know if you noticed today, if you would hear his voice. Did you notice the if? It's not a, a straight out imperative, hear his voice. It's an if statement. It's if you would hear, which lends the option of what? Of not hearing. Yeah, it's a choice. There's the option that you won't hear. But today, if you do hear his voice, how are we going to hear his voice? According to the Exodus 14 example we just gave, well, if we're complaining too much, we might miss it. If we're not listening, we might miss it. If we have gotten to a point in our lives where, spiritually speaking, we are unable to hear, we might miss it. But today, if, if you do, there's something about hearing. You, you can be bad at hearing and still hear something, right? You can, you can have lost almost all of your hearing, but if somebody's shouting loud enough, you can still hear them. How do I know? This has nothing to do with my wife and me at home, okay? It's nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing to do. Can't believe you took it there. Uh, today, if you would hear his voice, this is not a guaranteed thing. But today, if you do hear his voice, then you have a chance to respond in faith. So let's remember the words of Moses. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. It's a great promise. And I think it lends to where we're headed next down this rabbit hole.